Hi, it's Michelle from Lab Muffin Beauty Science, Chemistry PhD, and YouTuber with over 100,000 subscribers. I was told that real YouTubers do a Q&A when they reach a milestone number of subscribers, so here it is. I asked you to submit questions on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. I got a lot of replies, too many to do in one video, and so I tried to group together similar questions and um, really just cover the common ones. In the video, I'm going to start with questions about me and Lab Muffin Beauty Science, and then move on to some specific beauty and skincare questions in a rapid fire sort of way. I did get a lot of questions on how to use sunscreens, which I've actually answered before, in some of my previous videos. I'm planning to make more videos about sunscreen, even though most of us probably aren't getting much sun due to social distancing, but I've linked my previous video on how to wear makeup and sunscreen together in the video description. I did this as a get ready with me, so there's something interesting to look at while I answer these questions, but I'm not very good at makeup, so chances are I've skipped something or I had to fix it afterwards. If you like this sort of science heavy beauty content, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and you can click the notification bell so you don't miss any videos. I'm starting with a moisturizer since I'm not planning to go outside today and my house is really shady plus it's really cloudy and rainy today. So where do I live? I live in Sydney, Australia. I was originally born in Hong Kong and I moved here when I was two years old. Why is your channel called Lab Muffin Beauty Science? So I wanted to start a blog back in 2011 but I know that I personally tend to have this habit of not taking initiative and not doing things and giving myself excuses not to do things. So I spent a long time trying to decide on a name and then I realized I was just never going to pick one. So I just picked a name and decided I would just start blogging and I could change the name later, but then that never happened. Is YouTube, Instagram your full-time career or do you have another job? And if so, how do you balance your job and your blog? I do almost full-time now, but I do still have another job. I teach senior high school chemistry at a tutoring college. These are classes of about 15 students. I'm also writing an online textbook for high school chemistry. For a long time I was actually working full time as the chemistry coordinator for this tutoring college but as my blog ramped up I had to step down because it was just way too much for me. During that time our state in New South Wales was also switching syllabuses so me and my team had to rewrite all of the textbooks that all the teachers were teaching off so it was really full on and so basically to balance it I just had no personal life. Um, how else I managed to balance it. I planned everything meticulously. So I was working my full-time job every Tuesday to Saturday and so on Saturdays I would meticulously plan out what I was going to do on Sunday and Monday like to the hour. I had to-do lists. Yeah so that really helped. What would I be doing if I wasn't a blogger? I actually really loved my full-time job. It was really challenging but also really rewarding and I especially liked it because I was working with a really cool bunch of people. Everyone was really passionate and talented at educating. Um, so yeah, it was, it was sad to leave. I haven't really left. I still go in all the time and I, I'm still teaching there obviously. So it's really good that I have a lot more time now, but as a lot of you have probably discovered lately, working from home is actually pretty lonely. You don't have anyone to bounce ideas off. You don't have people to get a second opinion off very easily. So the next set of questions is a whole bunch of questions about me and science. What did my educational path look like? What drew me to chemistry? Did I always know that I wanted to be in science? What was my PhD thesis on? What was my, what was my motivation to do a PhD? What do I currently research and why did you leave academia? So first off, I'm no longer in academia, so that is affiliated with a university, so I don't currently do research. I do think it's important to acknowledge though that research scientists aren't the only real scientists. I think that sentiment comes from a toxic part of academia. So my educational path. I really loved chemistry in high school but I also really enjoyed arts. I, um, I did extension to English, which is um, where you get to do a major work. Um, so I did performance poetry. 
I did modern history. My schedule was sort of like a 50-50 arts and science split. I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, so um, I actually did chemistry Olympiad when I was in high school, and so there was an option where I could skip some of first year chemistry, so being a bit lazy, I decided to do combined science and law. I felt like that was like a good combination of science and arts. Yeah, so in Australia you have to pick your degree right out of high school as you're going into university. So as an as a 17 year old, I really had no idea what was going what I was going to do. So I kind of just yeah, picked a picked a degree based on what my friends were doing, what seemed good at the time, based on my very limited life knowledge, which I think is probably not the best decision or probably just not the best set of circumstances to make such a big decision under. So in Australia at the time, at the end of third year uni, you get to pick whether or not you do an honours year. So this is like a research year, um, and it's a pretty easy decision, honestly. So honours counts as like a master's, so if you want to progress to do a PhD, you only need to use one year. Plus you get extra letters at the end of your degree, um, plus you just defer the rest of your study for a single year. So that was an easy decision I decided to pick. I decided to do a research project. Um, at the time, I was also working in a law firm as a paralegal. And I discovered that I really loved doing that project and I really hated working in corporate law. So I decided to do a PhD. So in terms of my undergrad subjects, I did um, chemistry, pharmacology and physiology. I also did a bit of psychology and maths in first year. My PhD project was on cyclic peptides. These have lots of applications in medicinal chemistry and in supramolecular chemistry, which is the chemistry of how different substances interact without actually undergoing a chemical reaction. The problem with cyclic peptides is that it's quite hard to make them, so my project was on making them and then exploring their applications. So at the end of my PhD, I again was in the position where I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Um, so usually I do this step before I do blush, um, but because I'm distracted by the questions I forgot. But basically I'm using a heavier foundation to cover up some of my, um, some of the blemishes that are showing up through foundation. So yeah, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do with my life. Um, a lot of my peers were going into patent law um, or consulting or going on to do a medical degree. So if you want to continue in academia, you can do a postdoc. My boyfriend at the time um, accepted one in Switzerland and so I moved there with him. I knew I didn't personally want to stay in academia, so my supervisor told me there was no point doing a postdoc. There was also a lab accident in my final year of my PhD and that really put me off staying in academia and staying in research. Um, I actually had a bit of PTSD from that as well. When I was studying my PhD, I had the opportunity to do quite a bit of teaching. So I was taking first year tutorials and I was teaching in labs and I really, really loved that. The problem is there's not that many teaching opportunities in academia and the alternative is teaching in a high school, which I didn't think I, as a small Asian girl, would be able to do very well. Some of my friends at the time were tutoring at a tutoring college and they were saying it was really awesome and so I applied for that and then eventually they asked me to stay on full time. And the online textbook company grew out of that company so that's how I got brought on board to um, do the chemistry part. Um, so how old are you? So from my relatively long path you can probably guess that I am in my 30s. I am turning 33 this July. I graduated high school in 2004. I was quite young for my year and I went straight through um, my undergrad and my PhD. So I actually finished my PhD at 25. 
what made me start a YouTube channel? So like I said, I did a lot of teaching and as I was teaching, I found myself at the whiteboard drawing lots of stuff and moving my arms a lot. And that really highlighted um, the limitations of trying to just blog, so just having text and images. I think text isn't always the best way to communicate a complex concept in as simple a way as possible, and having a video means that I can do a lot more stuff. I can um, use a lot more tools to try to explain things to people. And I found that doing videos has actually allowed me to reach a very different audience, which is great. What made me so passionate about skincare and beauty? So when I started my blog back in 2011, I was really annoyed at the pseudoscience that was around, especially all the marketing myths. And I was really struck by the lack of people addressing these myths in an accessible way. So one of the career options I was looking at when I was doing my PhD was science communication. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people in science communication, especially male scientists, tend to dismiss beauty as something that's not worth their time, something that's a lost cause, which I think is really just a bit of misogyny. I think it comes from the fact that it is a very female heavy area and women's interests have always just been regarded as more frivolous and less serious than male pursuits. Even now when I talk to other science communicators I often get comments from men telling me that I should switch to something else so um, I'll put a couple up on the screen and you can see them. So for example, this guy thinks I should switch to talking about quantum computing. From a science communication perspective, I saw that many women are interested in it and it's a really good chance to get people interested in science. I found that the best way to get people interested in science is to tell them the science behind something that they're already interested in, something that's relevant to their everyday life, which quantum computing for most people just is not. What got me into skincare? Well, I've always had kind of troublesome skin. And I think that's the reason most people get into skincare. What have I changed my mind about? Half of the things I've actually researched in depth, to be honest. The further I've gotten into researching the science behind beauty products, the more I've realized that my gut feelings are not a good guide as to what the science is on anything. So fragrance and skincare, I used to think it was evil, now I am a lot less adamant about that. Alcohol and skincare, I also used to think that was evil. Um, jar packaging. Um, even aluminium, I used to think there was something behind the fears about aluminium, but then I realized it was really quite unfounded. On a less scientific note, um, my relationship with my appearance has changed a lot. I've always been pretty insecure about my looks, but as I've gotten older, the less I give a toss. Which part about my job is my favorite? Um, in terms of blogging, I love most things. So I really love researching and finding out about the real science behind how stuff works. I really enjoy the creative side of writing and um, making diagrams, um, making animations. I think the thing I like the least is definitely replying to emails. And replying to individual emails is fine, it's just when there's a massive volume of them and I do spend hours each week replying to emails, it's just never ending. Um, any advice for people wanting to get into chemistry? I think the biggest piece of advice that most Australian chemistry graduates give is check what the job opportunities actually are when you leave. 
try to ask someone relatively impartial, ask multiple people who are relatively impartial, because when you're applying for a university degree, most of them just want you to do that degree. It worked out well for them, and so they have a massive bias. Advice for people who want to understand chemistry but are really bad at school. Um, I think no one is really truly bad at chemistry. I think most people have just had bad teachers or just teachers whose style didn't work for them. So I think it's really a matter of finding a teacher whose style works for your learning style. There are some really good free online resources now for learning chemistry, so things like Coursera, um, YouTube series like Crash Course. I'll put a few links in the description. How do you like living in Australia? Best and worst parts? So I think the best part is almost definitely the fantastic weather. We also have a relatively nice lifestyle. We have universal healthcare, for example, and really good public transport in a lot of places. But I do think we have it pretty good here, so a lot of people are complacent. And I think with recent disasters, like the bushfires, the floods, and now COVID-19, the cracks are starting to show. So things like how we have a very casual-based workforce, our reliance on cheap, under-the-table imported labor, um, and decreased funding for public services, like our national broadband network, our internet is one of the worst in the world and increasing privatization of healthcare. So other terrible things about Australia, the shipping prices are awful and generic drugstore brands are really expensive. Things like Revlon, L'Oreal, Maybelline, they are at like the $20, $30 mark here. Am I going to start my own skincare or nail polish brand? I've definitely thought about it, but I just haven't really got a compelling idea yet, so we'll see. Which of my videos am I most proud of so far? Um, I'm really proud of my alcohol in skincare collaboration with Steven. Um, I put a lot of effort into the editing. It probably doesn't look worth it, but it took me hours and hours. And it took us a really long time for the research and I'm really proud of how rigorously we did it. Why haven't I made a video about insert topic? A lot of people ask that. How long does it take me to make a video? So I put these questions together because the second question answers the first question. My videos generally aren't very easy to make. I have really high standards, possibly impractically high standards for the information I put out. I feel like since I'm a scientist and I put myself out as a scientist in the public arena, I'm responsible for putting out scientifically rigorous information. And I generally just have that straight A student mentality. I want to put information out there that I can confidently stand by. And what that means is hours and hours of reading and literature searches. Um, I'm always fact checking and rechecking and rechecking continuously. And I'm only one person with 24 hours in a day. And so even with all of this, I still miss stuff and get stuff wrong. So the time required for a video can be upwards of 100 hours. So for example, for that alcohol video, Stephen and I actually started planning this in 2016 and it is now 2020. If it's a video with just basic chemistry information like my five minute crafts critique, then there's still a tiny bit of fact checking, but I can pump that out a lot faster. Um, I think that one took me eight to 10 hours. Also, I'm not very good at video editing. Um, what is my favorite snack? I love garlic dip. So this is tum, which is the garlic dip that's basically 60% oil and 40% garlic. It is delicious, my breath smells awful. I am eating the crap out of it while we're doing social distancing. Any tips for skincare during lockdown? Um, I think my only real tip is if it stresses you out, don't do it. If it helps you relax, do it. If you lost all of your skincare and makeup, which items would you repurchase first? So obviously one of the first things would be a sunscreen. My favorite is Ultraceuticals Daily Moisturizer. I also would want a cleanser and a moisturizer. I think the basics are by far the most important products in a routine. So for cleanser, I want something gentle. For a moisturizer, I probably just want something with glycerin. So the makeup I definitely need would be concealer, eyeliner, and 
a lipstick that can double up as blush. Which ingredients have made the most difference for your skin? Um, I would say tretinoin, which is a prescription vitamin A. Vitamin C and lactic acid. Alright, some quick fire skincare and beauty questions. Why don't I use SPF 100 since it's better than SPF 50? Um, we don't have SPF 100 in Australia, our highest is SPF 50 plus. Um, other reasons would be it doesn't feel good and if you don't wear enough of any sunscreen you won't get the specified protection. So if you put on an adequate amount of SPF 50 plus, it might actually work better than a tiny tiny bit of SPF 100. What age should you start to incorporate retinol into your skin routine? Um, if you're after anti-aging or anti-acne benefits, any age will do. So you can start it in your 20s. If you're using it for acne, you can even start it in your teens. How do we know if a claimed SPF is real? Um, there isn't really any way. At the moment, the only real way is to conduct a clinical test with 10 volunteers and use it on their skin. Is there really a difference between types of ingredients like ceramide in different products? Um, it really depends on the ingredient. With, um, with most ingredients, you can get impurities that are different um, based on who you've bought that ingredient off. Um, for things like glycerin, where it's um, only one type of molecule or water, then there generally isn't any difference. Um, with ceramides, there are different types of ceramides. So if it just says ceramide, you don't know which one it is. Um, so there's like ceramide one, three. If it's hyaluronic acid, there's tons and tons of different molecular weights that are all called hyaluronic acid. So yeah, depends. Is talc really unsafe in skincare? Um, so the main th thing that's wrong with talc is that it can have asbestos impurities. And asbestos is mostly bad if you inhale it. Cosmetic manufacturers are meant to check what the impurities are in talc and make sure it's asbestos free. Um, how do you protect your scalp from UV? Um, I would recommend a hat. I think that is the most practical way. Is it better to use a standard cleanser or micellar water for the second step of a double cleanse? It really depends on your skin, depends on the cleansers, depends on the micellar water. Can topical hyaluronic acid replace the hyaluronic acid in the lower layers of your skin? Um, no, so if by lower layers you mean the dermis, which is pretty low, um, it can't get down that far. In general, hyaluronic acid is really, really big. It can't get through deeper into your skin than like the very top layers. What are my thoughts on X product? Um, I try not to review products that I haven't personally tried because I think there's just so much in the formulation. You just cannot work out how a product will work just from looking at the ingredients list. So if I don't tell you my thoughts on a particular product, it's probably because I haven't tried it. Um, generally, if I've tried a product enough, I will review it. Are uh, enzyme exfoliants effective? Um, I have an exfoliation guide which talks about enzyme exfoliants. Yes, they are effective or they can be effective. Um, they tend to only really exfoliate the very surface layers of your skin. They are really good for irritated skin. How can I stop physical sunscreen from pilling? Um, I recommend just patting it on. Also check the compatibility of whatever you're putting on underneath it. The less stuff you put underneath a physical sunscreen or any product, um, the less likely that there is that there'll be an incompatibility which makes it pill. Um, I've also heard that sometimes if you put it on fast enough, then the film doesn't dry as you're trying to work it around your skin. Um, and anything else you put on top, again, pat it on and try not to disturb the film too much. What ingredients do you look for in a moisturizer? It really depends on your skin. In my ebook, The Lab Muffin Guide to Basic Skincare, I talk about how to pick one that fits your skin. Um, if you're asking about my personal skin, I love glycerin.
there's also an ingredient that I've just momentarily blanked out on the name of, um, which is in a bunch of sunscreens and it makes them feel amazing. I will look up that name and put it on the screen. Um, as well as my skincare guide, I also have a whole bunch of blog posts on moisturizer, which you can look at as well. Um, if you go to the search bar of my blog, you can find those. Which skincare supplements would I recommend? So from a scientific perspective, um, all supplements are unnecessary unless you are actually deficient in a particular nutrient. So for example, most people are deficient in vitamin D in winter in most countries. So I wouldn't recommend any skincare supplements. I think a balanced diet is much better. So other skin related supplements that um, if you're deficient in can make your skin bad. Vitamin B, omega-3. Yeah, talk to a doctor if you think you might be deficient in one of these. Do moisturizing products need to be sealed in with oil? No. Um, there are studies where they just use glycerin and that was fine without anything on top. Moisturizing products might work more efficiently if you do put oil on top though, so try it out on your skin. What does it mean when skin doesn't need to breathe? It means skin does not need oxygen from the air. So there's no biological reason why you need to make sure your skin has enough exposure to air. Why do older sunscreen filters irritate skin more and give more allergic reactions than newer ones? Um, basically because newer ones are specifically designed with not irritating and not giving allergic reactions in mind. So newer ones tend to be bigger, which means they don't go into skin as easily. And so they can't get into the living layers and cause irritation or allergic reactions. Can you use AHAs and BHA with retinol? It depends on your skin, they might be too irritating, but there's no rule that you cannot. Are there specific ingredients that close your pores and give you acne? It depends on your skin. Everyone is slightly different. Um, the same ingredient formulated into different products will have a different effect. So check out my comedogenicity video if you want more information about that. Won't telomeres shorten with retinol? Um, your skin has cells where the telomeres don't shorten, which means that you will not exfoliate and run out of skin or you won't use retinol and run out of skin at any point within your lifetime. So that is it. I think my face is done. It is very possible that I've forgotten to do something. Since I'm not good enough at makeup to do two things at once. I hope you liked this video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. You can also subscribe to my channel for more videos where I talk about the science behind beauty products. You can follow me on Instagram and you can check out my blog for more as well. Please don't yell at my makeup technique or perhaps yell at me gently. I'm clearly not the most experienced at doing makeup. So if you have any tips for me, leave them in the comments. Please don't yell at me, Larry. Um, I will see you next time.